Hello, welcome to Violin Virtuoso, Kirsten Leon. Hello, thank you so much for, for having me, Leia. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, but I know that you agreed to play some music for us at the beginning. Absolutely. So I thought I would just play a, a little movement from Yezai, so one of his um, one of his six sonatas for solo violin, the fourth. This is the first movement, so it's it's funny since each each sonata is dedicated to one of Yezai's colleagues, mm -hmm. and of course this one is dedicated to uh, a name that I think we all love very much. It's Chrysler. That's right. So this is the first movement from that. It's called the Alamond. Thank you so much. Take your time. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Wow, thank you so much. That was completely transporting. You really captured a lot of um, kind of the improvisatory feel of these pieces. Absolutely. Well, actually, this is, um, it's nice that you point that out because for me originally, um, the reason why I actually got interested, very interested in exploring the whole set of sonatas in depth is in a way it was, I saw the, the opportunity to at once be sort of grounded completely musically to have to establish some sort of you know, overall architecture, but also to have this foundation, but in the end also to push, I guess, some certain creative impulses as well, that somehow the, these pieces and their characters, they allow me to do that within a certain established sphere, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that was actually, um, yeah, it's for, for me to be, at once reverent, but also creative in a sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eugène Isaïe, a Belgian violinist, not everyone knows who he was. He was actually a pretty interesting musical figure. Absolutely. So he was, he was um, a very, you could say, legendary figure of the first half of the 20th century. In fact, I think, uh, I think one of his, I forgot exactly who it was, but one of his esteemed colleagues that said that he was probably the first violinist in history to play completely in tune or something. But he was very much like considered the first modern violinist. So he laid down, I guess, a lot of the, 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 the foundation for a lot of, I guess, the technical expectations, but also the kind of perhaps pointed the way for the sound world as well mm -hmm. um, that we find ourselves in. And of course, throughout the 20th century, he was very much an influence on, on many of his younger colleagues, you know, um, um, I guess Milstein, for example, called him the Tsar, so the Russian, I guess, and for king of the violin. So he's very much an esteemed figure, and you could tell by 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 these sonatas, but also just like in general, he he was a very, in a way, prolific composer as well. That had you know many different ideas, interesting ideas, and you could tell also that he was quite ahead of his time. For example, I guess even taking one of his violin sonatas, the fifth one, mm -hmm. you know, you almost get the, get the sense that, um, that he's very much ahead of his time. It's very abstract. It's very, it allows for much, um, much exploration, I guess, and creativity in a way it's looking into the future very much. So yeah, definitely a figure. I think that, uh, you know, I would, would love to that more people to know, I guess, mm -hmm. and also to hear his music. Because for me, I think, well, the the when it comes down to it, I was just mainly very struck by the musical language. It was something that hit very personal for me. So the um, the idea to to uh, to do to record the six sonatas after performing them several times in concert was inevitable for me. Yeah. So talk about where you recorded them. Yes. Yeah, so this recording I recorded a few months before the start of the pandemic, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, at the concert hall of the Domaine Forgé, which is uh, sort of on the, on the shores of the St. Lawrence, in deep, deep in Quebec, mm -hmm. um, perhaps, I guess, um, an hour and a half or two hours uh, north of uh, Quebec City. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a wonderful place. They have a wonderful music festival, music academy, and they have a, a wonderful concert hall as well that's acoustically excellent. And so... Um, it was really a luxury to do it in such a place, you know, um, and also with such an excellent producer as well, with Carl Talbot. Mm -hmm. I worked with him for my first, my very first album, actually, uh, a few years back called Bis. Mm -hmm. It was a collection of uh, encore pieces or short pieces with piano with Philip Chu. So I really enjoyed my experience. Like it was a very enlightening experience working with that. So it was a, an obvious choice to work with him again. Mm -hmm. And so what we actually did was that we, we stripped down all the curtains on the walls of the hall, which is already very reverberant, it's mm -hmm. very live sounding, but we made it almost even more 
in the direction of a cathedral in a way by stripping down to have more hard surfaces mm -hmm. and concrete, for example, um, that we could really just create this um, atmosphere that was very appropriate for um, for the vision, I guess, that I had for these pieces. And also, I guess, Carl's idea of my sound as well. It was very much a collaboration in that sense. So, um, yeah, we recorded it in, in a space of in a space of four days. The, mm -hmm. the, uh, the six sonatas and uh, yeah it was just a, a wonderful you know one of those experiences that you that is so intensely personal in a way that you you wouldn't forget for the rest of your life mm -hmm. you know even though of course I think I was physically and, and mentally and emotionally torn apart by the end but I think those are one of those you know those moments that you go through that you're like okay these are the moments that define you know that define my life you know in a way so, yeah. And you have a personal connection to Isai in that your mentor, um, Dume, studied with Milstein, who studied with Isai, right? Yeah, basically, in a way, it's, it's actually, um, it's funny because, of course, Isai can be considered as part of the sort of the Franco-Belgian school of, of violin playing. And actually, both, uh, in a way, I could be considered uh, through the if you want to call it the lineage, you mm -hmm. could say, as part of that as well, through, of course, uh, Roussan Dumais, who I worked with uh, for four years in the in the Queen Elizabeth Music Chapel in Belgium. In turn, of course, he studied with Milstein and with Grumio as well. Grumio was uh, also a promo of one of the Franco-Belgian school. So in a way, it was, it was, uh, it's, it's definitely a sound world that I'm, that I feel very close to, I think, and also having grown up with um, you know, uh, the, the great players of the 20th century. I mean, those were always recordings and always images that were around when I was growing up. I mean, you know, of course, my tastes have greatly diversified since, but it still remains a very, um, yeah, a sound world that's very familiar in a way and that's very uh, close. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I can draw from, I find, very, very naturally at this point, is the kind of ideals that, let's say, they would have had, or I would, I would perceive in that era of playing or that style of playing, you know, the texture and the sound, the, the development of notes, you know, even within individual notes, just such mm -hmm. development and such texture and such layering. I think there's certain aspects, you know, uh, whether you want, want to call it, I think, old fashioned or not, but I think there are certain, certain um, aspects in that, you know, that you perceive in, in, in sound of players of that era that I really take inspiration from. So. Mm -hmm. And your time, you were an art, um, artist in residence at the Queen Elizabeth Chapel in yes. Waterloo, Belgium. So, and Isai founded that. Absolutely. It's a Absolutely. pretty special. He founded that place. actually with uh, the institution with Queen Elizabeth uh, of Belgium. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth was also, I guess, a very much a violent enthusiast and music lover. So, in a way, it's, 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 it's pretty. It's pretty amazing to, uh, you know, having, let's say, been aware um, of Yazai's music and, you know, from from a certain distance. I mean, of course, we were all in the violin playing world hear of Yazai's name um, at some point. But then after a certain while to to come to a place that is so directly linked to such a composer um, and to such a history, I guess, that really fascinated me a lot more and definitely played a huge part in um in in my my interest in these sonatas and wanting to record them mm -hmm. yeah for alpha classics so but your experience at the queen elizabeth chapel it's not a regular music school by any stretch can oh, you speak to that yeah. it's it's uh it's definitely not a a regular um conservatory or regular institution with a curriculum it's actually more i would i would kind of characterize it as more of a of a stepping stone institution in a way it's like you know you allow for for professional experience or i guess like you know getting used to giving concerts and kind of collaborating on projects and collaborating with whether it's your your fellow fellow young musicians or with uh, people who have uh, much more experience than you have you know for example we send you may but also gary hoffman for example miguel da silva louis lorty is of course also Canadian, and so that was a really uh, a really cool institution to be part of 
And I mean, there's also this aspect of the symbolic, I guess, that symbolized professional life, professional experience, but also this very private side as well. That um, because it, the, the music chapel itself is situated in the middle of a forest, almost, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's just on the edge of a town called Waterloo. So that's uh, the Battle of Waterloo, you know, mm -hmm. where um, that's, I guess, the, that's where it's famous from. But uh, so that's, that's, it's very, it's a very secluded in a way, very, um, very calm area mm -hmm. and also has stated state of the art facilities where you can actually um, really, that at least for me, it really allowed me to go inwards, you know, and to, to have the time and the space and the, and the peace to really explore things in depth, but just within yourself, your own relationship with the music, you know, and that I think was extremely consequential, you know, in the sense that it, it gave me the awareness of what was actually possible, uh, you know, with that kind of intensity of, of um, looking inward, you know, what can come out, you know, what kind of revelations would you have? And uh, I think because of that, it was it was a very, very fruitful um, time and experience. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about your interpretation of Bach. I got to hear uh, the recent solo recital that was broadcast um, on behest of the uh, Scotia Music Festivals. Amazing, amazing recital. Thank you for that. And I was, I, I'm going to say pleasantly surprised. I didn't expect your Bach to be that, you know, um, full of color, Baroque color. I just expected it to be more romantic, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of influences did you have when you're studying in Europe? Yeah, so basically, I think like for me, when it, when it comes to, to something like um, Bach, or Yisai, stuff like this, I think it's, 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 uh, it was very much uh, for each of this, each of these separate repertoires, I guess, it, it's a very personal, or I guess I have a very personal way of approaching it, I guess. Um, but certainly for Bach, I think, you know, of course I was influenced at the beginning. I heard pretty much the Bach cycles by sharing, for example, by Grumio, by Milstein, you know, of course those are, you know, those are powerful renditions that you can never really forget, you know, but also I think recently I've just been really inspired by you know the kind of um the excitement that's going on in the baroque scene at the moment as well especially um what i've seen in europe for example there's just such a there's such an interest and there's such a there's such a there's such an energy and care i guess that is very inspirational that i find in in, in this kind of um you know new baroque uh, approach that i find is really um, that's really influenced me a lot. I think also it's a, a lot about um, having really started to listen to um, organ music, for example, mm -hmm. or um, just sort of, uh, I guess in general, I'm very influenced by keyboard music and the mm -hmm. purity that comes along with it, or at least the purity that, 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 that I perceive, you know, that, and I very much, this sense of purity and this sense of, essence like stripping down things i think has also very much influenced um very my my bach playing a lot and also when it comes to choir music as well mm -hmm. there's a certain yeah i guess it's the there's a simplicity to it and yet there's a there's a real um, all-encompassing aspect and so i try to i guess for bach um encompass that in the sound mm -hmm you know, capture that element of simplicity, but also that expansiveness that can come with that, you know, and to, um, yeah, to try and strip things down to its essence, I guess, as I see it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess, um, and of course, that would also have influenced my Yisai playing, also there's a direct link as well, because Yisai was directly inspired by Bach. Mm -hmm. you know, six sonatas, six, three sonatas and three partitas, so six for Bach, six for Yisai. And the first sonata was or was directly inspired by um, a performance of the, the Bach G minor sonata, so the first sonata. So everything is very linked. Of course, there is a there is it's a completely different sound world, you know, that allows for a lot more, I guess, you know, um, consistent with these eyes time or that kind of sound world that allows you to wear your heart on your sleeve, perhaps, or mm -hmm. be a lot more. Um, 
in a way extroverted um, expression or intention, mm -hmm. expressive uh, intention. Um, however, there is also that expansiveness and that sort of um, that purity that also comes along, mm -hmm. I think. So in a way, they both uh, it's it's very interesting to to for both approaches to be very distinct, but also for them to have very very many things in common as well. So, yeah. so speaking of different sound worlds, during the lockdown, I know you did some really fun arrangements that you've put up on your YouTube. Uh, beautiful Oblivion by Piazzolla. And I believe you're playing viola in that as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you played quite a bit of viola in chamber music? Um, I haven't yet, actually. Mm -hmm. I've maybe, the, the closest that you could call, I guess, chamber music with viola, I did uh, with uh, with uh, Jonathan Crow, for example, several mm -hmm. years ago. I mean, this was a long time ago, perhaps. But of course, and Jonathan is a former film professor um, of mine and a very dear friend now. Um, and we played uh, Pasacalia together. Okay. I think that was the very first time that, even though it was, I think, for a, for a small house concert, but it was my first venture, mm. if you could call it that, I guess, uh, into the, the viola the viola world, you could say. Um, I just find that, you know, for me, the viola, it represents, it rep of course, it's of the same essence of the violin, you know, but at the same time, I find that it gives me this ability to separate myself from a lot of, let's say, established notions, you could say, or or um, things that already are. It just gives me another avenue to explore perhaps other concepts or other sound worlds mm -hmm. or even other styles that, uh, that I'd be interested in. I just find it, it's kind of like, you could call it my guilty pleasure mm -hmm. instrument. Yeah. You know, I do play it quite a bit in in private, mm -hmm. you know, at, at my own leisure. But I think, uh, you know, it's just something that I that, that I love using for that kind of exploration. I think for me, though, I think for me to, let's say, um, play classical repertoire or play uh, chamber music repertoire with viola, I would, you know, I would I would give myself, I would say, several months of, mm -hmm. of or a, a good a good amount of good chunk of time to settle in to develop the kind of sound ideal mm -hmm. that you know that you would if you would be playing your main instrument you know mm -hmm. that's something that's i think a, a respect that you give to the instrument but also to the music that you play so that would be sort of um that would be what i think about that but for now i think it's it's definitely something that i i love to just explore new things with at my mm -hmm. leisure you know it's very much that guilty pleasure instrument and when you make record um, arrangements, are you doing it on a keyboard? Are you hearing everything in your head? How do you do that? Yeah, so I think it it definitely, of course, you would have to notate it somewhere. So obviously, I have a I have a sort of a, a, a MIDI keyboard yeah. for that it helps a lot. But um, it usually just comes from um, you know when you hear something and you kind of let your imagination go wild. So it's like you know different representations of the same atmosphere of the same idea so i just try and kind of well i don't even try sometimes i just sort of let it go almost and let my imagination go um you know let myself be as creative as i can or kind of um be very almost casual about it you know even though of course you know everything i do um you know is there's there's definitely a weight to it you know everything that i want to do is, is something that I really do believe in, for example, even if it's something like a, it's a simple arrangement that I do want to do also the, the whatever the material justice as well. So yeah, I, I, it tends to happen all in the head. Then I try it out, for example, and um, if something works, if I like how things, and sometimes of course I have to see if things fit together, you know, let's say if there's many different voices in one, then I find, okay, does this work? Does these two work together? Then I just go like that, and then I start to notate, and it's 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 a really fun process. I think it's it's really stimulating, and it also allows me to to free myself, I guess, in in in, in many different ways, you mm -hmm. know, and also free myself from the instrument as well. So I think that's actually something that um, very much throughout 
is a general goal is to, in a way, when you make music, to transcend the instrument or to, to you know, make yourself or other people forget about the instrument, but just to behold the music itself or the idea itself. And I think uh, doing arrangements and letting my mind run like this, I think, is, is a great way of um, reinforcing that. Mm -hmm. Kind of a balancing break, too, from all the woodshedding we have to do. Of course, yes. Course. And you have a really interesting connection with physics. Yeah, so that's actually it's uh, it's something that that started with my with my dad actually. So my dad is a physicist, and um, he just after after a certain while, of course, he was always a, very much a music lover. But after a while, he started to take interest, like going to observe different musicians, for example, different violinists, or to observe what they say, but also try and make start to make connections between what would first seem as ideas that would be contradictory, let's say, you know, or expressed differently and to, to find connections in a, in a sort of from a scientific point of view and also learn about, um, or I guess he taught me a lot about, about how things actually function, like how the string behaves when it vibrates and, you know, what would be, for example, the optimum way to, to, to excite it and to how to think about it. So, I mean, all these things, of course, I wouldn't consider myself at all a physics expert, definitely not. But I think a lot of these things that that uh, my dad has uh, sort of, I guess, experimented with me with, I guess, um, and uh, have really influenced, like, just like the practical, the way to apply these ideas. I just would find my own way to perhaps interpret these ideas and, and that would influence my playing a lot. Um, and to the point where actually several years back, my dad and I, of course he would use me as a sort of guinea pig, which was actually kind of cool. It was very interesting. And uh, you know, he, he gave together, I mean, uh, me and me as the guinea pig and he, you know, he gave lectures about the subject, for example, in Beijing during the menuing competition in 2012, mm -hmm. I think, in some universities in California as well. And, in, in Norway as well and, and so it was uh, it's, it's something that uh, I constantly think about like it's 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 not something that perhaps I'm I'm uh, aware of or I try to think of specifically like the scientific aspect while I play I mean it's, it's a very I would it's a it's, it becomes a natural process but it's still something that that evolves I guess and also um, evolves my approach as well constantly um yeah mm -hmm. the strings they vibrate sideways right like they actually like in a way it's very it's very cool because when you when you see this sort of um when you see a string vibrate actually there's a kink that kind of goes around mm -hmm. so it can it's helmholtz hook motion basically um and it's it's just it's incredible it's almost as if the string is turning it's like it's just sort of going around in a loop there's a certain kink that goes you know throughout the whole length of of the string and it's throughout the whole amplitude and it just sort of goes around and goes and spins and spins so i think there's whole this this idea that really um that actually over time made me think of let's say the bow bow um bow action or bow motions less as let's say a straight point A to point B, but actually more as a a constant sort of transformation of energy, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a storing of energy or it's the release of energy. So anything like even like a like a certain, no matter how you could say how how sharp the articulation, how soft the dynamic, how fast the note, how short, how um, how long. It's all the same sort of. I would try and think of it always as a transformation or like a, like a transformation of energy. So everything kind of has this release to it. I think that's a lot of the, uh, a big key to sound production, especially the projection. Let's say in a, in a concert hall, is that it's basically releasing a lot of the energy that's built up, not just sort of transferring it onto the instrument with force, so mm -hmm. to say, but to find the way through not just relaxation, but controlled use of tension mm -hmm. as well. I mean, that's a very big, uh, it's a controlled release of tension that can, that can create that kind of uh, 
release in the sound. And I think you can, it's definitely something that you can perceive in the sound as well. And it's when sound is properly released. So yeah, we can definitely hear it in your sound. Um, I'm curious about a couple of ways you have of working. Do you have basics or warm ups that you tend to, to keep doing? Or have you kind of dropped that by now? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think uh, I focus a lot these days on sort of this, like the speed of trend of physical transitions, mm -hmm. like especially in, like, for example, in the left hand, the speed of, let's say, anything from finger dropping or finger lifting, you know, to change notes, mm -hmm. shifting, even stretching, you know, but all to do it so that, and to, to do it at a speed, let's say to work it up to a certain speed where it becomes very active, very impulse, almost like an impulse, you know, that there's less, there's um, the least amount of sort of big muscle activity mm -hmm involved in making such small actions because there's simply no need i think and and there's a and it really does sort of um keep me keep me very very uh yeah just very reactive you could say um that i feel focused on a lot let's say when i um when i slowly get back into playing let's say to also to recuperate um after after a long concert the next day i would also start slowly with that and slowly work my way to make sure also that there's less um well not um not more tension that there needs to be yeah. also in certain parts um and i always just try to also um when it comes to the to the bow arm as well like just to make sure that that there is, it's sort of like dividing things into, in, you could say, infinitesimals, kind of like, you know, to make sure that every, that in every instant of the bow, you know, that you, you absolutely know exactly what you're doing, you know, and you focus really on that, you are, you a lot, let's say, a period in your practice where that's really the main focus, whereas otherwise, when you're actually playing, it becomes second nature, it becomes something that you don't think about. But I think that sort of, um, yeah, emphasis on body awareness. Mm. I would say that's that's something that I would say is is very makes up a big big part of my warm ups. Yeah. Mm. So I'm impressed because you're you're young and you obviously um, have such facility from such a young age that you have that analytical side because you've produced these really great uh, YouTube videos talking about technique, and I I think that's great because if you just rely on the instinctive part at a certain point if things aren't working. You know, then it's a lot of work to figure that out because at a certain point, we're always our own teachers, right? Absolutely. I think there was a, there was, you know, there's certain things because I think it's, it's also, you know, the kind of experiences or lessons that you take from, from growing up or just from life in general. I think there was definitely, I mean, in, in, you know, definitely seeing, I guess, um, looking back in the years, for example, when I would be, you know, transitioning from, I guess, the 13 year old or 14 year old that just having one menu in competition mm -hmm. and starting to kind of do that. But then of course, transitioning from that to, let's say when you're 15, 16, when you become self-conscious, when things, you know, things you can't really sort of, or you don't, you lose certain things. You don't understand why you just become less fearless. I think those were very much low points in my life as well during that period. Mm -hmm. You know, there were certain things, certain circumstances, I guess, during those times that would really force me to just look inward and look at my own body and try and really sort of um, understand certain things for myself, you know, without, of course, having it be like a constant obsession. But I think it was more just like a way to cope with myself. Like you're always, you know, I think, of course, you know, with artists, I think we're always in a contest with ourselves. We're always very much looking at ourselves with a critical point of view. You know, and uh, this was just a way, I guess, to to uh, process that in a in a healthy way. And so, a, a lot of this um, technical work, and also just the technical setup, and and you could even say, I guess, the technical style as well. And you know, the way I do things stems very much from that. It's just uh, the general idea of finding myself in times when you know you feel the necessity to 
you know, because you're losing yourself. You had one version of yourself, for example, when you were a, you know, a so-called young kid, young prodigy or whatever, but then that would fade away. Then you would have to find what is really the essence within yourself. And so I think, um, you know, the, the technical aspect, the analytical side of playing was just one aspect of that. Yeah. And um, yeah. No, it's just I had a, a nerdy question. One thing you said I found super interesting. You mentioned about the thumb that needs a certain strength and you talk about its independence. And that was like a lightning bolt moment for me because all I've ever really heard people talk about, including I think Galamian's book, is just like keep that thing relaxed, right? <laughs> and it's always about relaxing the thumb. But of course, there's counter pressure and we do need strength in the thumb. And for me, one of my problems is it has a tendency to get in the wrong position you know, and I have to keep reminding myself, you know, get that where it needs to be for my hand to work properly because I have a super small hand. Right. But what yeah. did you, if you could elaborate on that a little bit more about the thumb. Yeah, absolutely. I think I was basically talking like from the position that I think um, if there is certain, I guess if there's a, it comes from the, from the aspect of security in a way. Like sometimes, of course, we, 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 we're afraid of, let's say, just the thumb slipping or kind of losing position, of mm -hmm. course. And a lot of that, a lot of, so I guess a lot of, uh, subtle tension could arise just from that fear alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, well, I guess the strengthening aspect is to, to increase security is to just basically assure yourself a little bit more to make sure that your thumb is able to, to respond mm -hmm. to subtle changes in the left hand, especially, I think like even just going one step back, I think it really stemmed from, uh, my, I guess my experimenting with playing without shoulder rest. Well. I was just gonna ask about that. Yeah, absolutely. It's just it's a huge. It's actually a huge um, technical topic for me. I think it was one of the, if not the most consequential for me, was to, to, uh, you know, to to stop playing with shoulder rest. I think it was around when I was sixteen or seventeen. Mm -hmm. So maybe around um, eight years ago, I would say, um, that I that I made that decision. It was less about removing the shoulder rest itself, but it was just sort of, I guess, made me realize what what a world of technical subtleties and things, especially in the left arm and left hand, especially if you think of, let's say, holding the violin as a balance, as a balance of responsibility between the left hand, the thumb is a big part of that, obviously, and let's say the shoulder or collarbone, that there's just a whole wealth of things that you end up learning that you had no, you had no idea existed before because the shoulder has did a lot of it for you, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I guess the thumb, so the, the thumb, I just find that, yeah, if it, if it, if it lacked the, the strength, the, the kind of elasticity that comes along with it to be able to adjust quickly to different position changes, then there can be, you know, uh, just there can be an amount of tension that can build up either, you know, in this part or even further down the arm that we may not realize. And so I think that was a lot of, um that was something that that you know i felt like this sort of sometimes you would feel the kind of tension you would figure out why but then you would actually end up just doing some some random thumb exercises for example even just like to be able to curl the thumb mm -hmm. to curl the thumb and to to have the security of able to let's say curl the fingerboard or curl the neck with your thumb without any of the other fingers involved and without shoulder rest involved i think that's immediately something that gives perspective and not only you know, it strengthens the thumb, makes it more kind of, you know, feel, feels more warmed up and more reactive, but it just, um, yeah, it's, it's very much uh, um, assurance as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask you about your process of memorization for new music. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, for me, it's been very hard to actually, um, to express it in, yeah, to express it concretely, it's been something I've always been thinking about, like, how do you explain it? For me, it's always been been quite a quite an intuitive process, I think. It was just, you know, when you hear a piece of music, then you're able to sort of map it out. But actually what makes the mapping possible, or at least what makes that, uh, what, what, what makes it, uh, uh, what starts the process, I guess, is when you think more in the, in the, bigger picture in the sense is not only the sort of the harmonic functions in the piece, but also like the feelings or the, the specific sensations that those har those harmonies give. 
and in a way it's sort of i would i would imagine it's almost like you know let's say if, if an actor is memorizing let's say a play or something and there's of course you know pressure of delivery and you know there's there's, there's all that all these factors that, that combine that it's like one word or one word that appears that immediately opens the door to another paragraph you know that those are the sort of markers that set in your head and i think very much the way it, the very personal perception of color that comes from harmony from analyzing it i guess grouping it into bigger you know those kind of harmonic changes or whatever is very much like that one feeling sets off you know another section and reminds you okay this is what comes along with it um and so that would be the way like for example when i was you know performing in a bartok second concerto for example which is a, a, quite a difficult one to memorize because mm -hmm. it's you know, it's quite a lot, of, quite a lot of uh, of different things. It's also not, it's you know, things are not predictable. A lot of the times, you have to to rely on muscle memory to to execute a passage work. But for me, it was like to to try and really, of course, you practice the individual practice passage work, but then you try and group it into a way, especially with harmonic language as rich as like a mind boggling. And as evocative as Bartox, I think it was that was very much a help. I think um, so. Yeah, I guess that's the best way I could describe it. It's that one harmony. You let's say select one harmony or one feeling, one sensation that immediately becomes a marker for mm -hmm. another section that helps you navigate. So that's very interesting. And upcoming projects. What's coming up for you? Yeah, so uh, basically next month I'll be uh, performing with uh, the uh, Les Violons du Roi. Uh, it's just uh, I'm very excited. It'll be the first time that I, that I work with them. Also, I'm going to be uh, performing uh, two concerts for Toronto Summer Music mm -hmm. as well in Toronto with uh, virtual concerts. One chamber music uh, concert on the 27th, I believe, with, uh, with uh, Stéphane Tétrault, cellist, and Angela Schwarzkopf, harpist. And also, of course, the other concert with the National Academy Orchestra, where I'll be performing Mendelssohn Concerto as well as a modern concerto by composer Avner Dorman. So, um, yeah, very excited. I mean, I've been very, very lucky actually during this, uh, during the pandemic, to continue to do occasional virtual concerts. I mean, these are experiences that you know, once you have this particular perspective, that you miss a lot of these things. Obviously, you never take any of these things for granted as well. It's just such such a nourishment and in a way such a privilege as well mm -hmm. to, to, to make music um, and to make music with colleagues as well. So I'm just very, very excited, very happy. And uh, yeah, and uh, fingers crossed for next season. I think uh, things are also looking, looking, uh, uh, things are starting to sort of happen again, mm -hmm. I guess. But uh, yeah, so we'll hope for the best. Yeah, there'll be links to all your upcoming things in the description of this video as well. Of course, your website, which will be updated. So if people listen to this later on, they'll see what you're currently up to. And just finally, could, do you have any words of advice for aspiring virtuosos, for children out there working really hard who really want to be Kirsten Leon? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, for me, I think it, it comes down to, um, like when I look at my, my, my I guess, um path you could call it um in a way a lot of things happen in a very non-linear way mm -hmm. and i think a, but a lot of those let's say things that were set into motion were because you know of course at a certain age when you're young when you enjoy doing something from from a particular perspective and you're, you know, let's say you become good at it, it becomes fluent. But I think when it comes to, let's say, becoming a, not just a virtuoso, but an all-encompassing musician and a serious musician at that, um, is when, for me, at least I recognize there was a moment when I was 16 or 17, when suddenly music making became personal. Mm -hmm. You know, that it wasn't, it wasn't just a, a fun activity anymore, or in some cases, what felt like a chore or an obligation or just something that you do as extracurricular activity you could, whatever it might be but it just suddenly became a necessity for life you know mm -hmm. for living for 
you know, the exploration of yourself, you know, which is a necessity for growing up as well. So I think, I think the most, what I could say from that is just the most important thing is to, to, um, and I think a lot of it happens not only, of course, with music education, the importance of that, but also the importance of the mindset that you have when you practice. I know that, of course, when when you're young, you know, practicing may not be the most natural thing, may not be the thing that you want to do the most. But I think it's very, it's 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 a worthwhile thing to to find pleasure in the little details. Yeah. You know, to be very fat, to just find fascination with things that, you know over a period of time you may take for granted or you may get used to. But I think uh, it's that mindset of fascination of constantly being, you know, yeah, that pleasure that also drives, I guess, the the want to get better and the want to explore more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I would say, just take pleasure in the little details and to really, um, to really find a personal relationship with the music you know find perhaps music that you love to play you know work towards pieces of music that you loved that you would love to play you know i think that um that would be i guess in my mind the ideal way to go about to start at least so yeah enjoy and and uh and yeah really uh find your connection with the music it's great advice for all musicians, amateur or professional. Um, you speak so eloquently about music. I found this conversation really inspiring. And thanks so much for, for playing at the beginning. Of course, people can hear the your recordings um, and hear the beautiful sound of the Domaine Forget um, Hall as well. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Leah, for having me. <laughs>